I want to share with you my, my research on Parkinson's disease. So my story with Parkinson's disease began in one of the most unlikely of places. The town of Mammoth, Arizona is home to about 1,500 people and is located in an otherwise unremarkable part of our state. But it is in this humble town of Mammoth that my story and research with Parkinson's disease would begin. In Mammoth, Arizona, I met a man named Jesse. Jesse was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease at the relatively young age of 40 years old. Now, before I had met Jesse, I'd heard only about Parkinson's in popular culture and only read it as a footnote in medical journals. But after meeting Jesse, Parkinson's all became real. And I thought, why hasn't someone else already found a cure for Parkinson's already? It's a disease that we've known about literally for centuries. And yet, the progress on Parkinson's has barely changed in the last 60 years. So I decided that I would dedicate part of my research to finding a possible treatment for Parkinson's disease. This started off at a very uh, interesting point in my life. Prior to that, I decided that I wanted to be an aerospace engineer. When I was in middle school, I had dedicated that I was going to go either into electrical or aerospace engineering industries. And when I was in high school, I competed in the Intel International Science Fair and a variety of engineering and embedded systems projects. But after knowing Jesse and seeing his struggle, all of that quickly changed. I decided that for my final international science fair project, I would try to find a, a possible treatment for Parkinson's in a direction that people had not looked and researched before. So previously knowing nothing about Parkinson's disease, I delved headfirst into any scientific material I could read about it. I think I read about 500 different research papers on disease and saw that the cause of Parkinson's disease is deceptively simple. A protein in the brain known as alpha-synuclein, which usually has a very important function in our body system, misfolds and aggregates on the dopamine-producing neurons. This triggers the deadly cascade towards the effects of Parkinson's that we see later on. For healthy individuals, we have something called chaperone proteins. These chaperones prevent the deadly aggregation of this alpha-synuclein. Think of these chaperones as the inspectors on the protein assembly line, making sure that each protein is up to the standards set by our genetic code. I started reading the research of Dr. Jim Shorter at the University of Pennsylvania, who had looked at these chaperones vis-a-vis -vis Parkinson's disease and noted that they have a critical role in the progression of this illness. I thought, well, what if there was a way to, in essence, build a better chaperone protein? In this manner, we could use the body's own defenses to halt Parkinson's disease. This simple yet incredibly strong idea would form the nucleus of my future research. Now, in theory, designing a new protein sounds very simple. I, I thought of it as if I were designing a new airplane or a new circuit board. You just put it in a CAD model and, and turn it around and redesign it. But I quickly realized it was not as straightforward as that. I initially thought, what if we had a database of these proteins and could index them and search out the best one for reversing Parkinson's? Think of it like a molecular Google. But I did a quick back of the envelope calculation to see how long this would take. And I found out that it would take around 300,000 years. And I had slightly less time to complete my research. <laughs> so clearly, I needed to find a more ingenious and intelligent way to navigate the protein interaction labyrinth. This issue would be the rise of an algorithm that I call Niragami. Neuro for brain and gami from origami, referencing the protein folding nature of this problem. Neurogami would essentially design the protein from the ground up while also referencing a database, having the best of both worlds and using machine learning in order to develop the best possible approach. Now, importing the biomedical sphere into the machine learning sphere was certainly a non-trivial task and came with not without its challenges. 
I remember many late nights coding, trying to get this Nirigami algorithm to work and feeling all the frustrations of having it stop working at the most inopportune times. I even remember one particular mishap when we were running this protein on public servers, and when a mistake happened, we ended up taking down the University of Chicago servers. <laughs> so if you're watching now, I'm very sorry. <laughs> but after this trial and error and some more error, we were able to find a short list of chaperone proteins. These proteins, in simulation at least, were able to reverse Parkinson's. Now, my challenge then was to translate this simulation of Parkinson's disease and bring it into the real world. So I did the logical thing and I emailed 10 labs across the country, begging them to test my potential compounds and their respective models of Parkinson's disease. However, nine of those labs firmly said no. And only one of those labs said yes. And that was the Zarneski lab at the University of Arizona. <laughs> Dr. Zarneski and her lab resources would become an invaluable part of my Parkinson's research. What her lab specializes in is a fruit fly model of neurodegenerative diseases. So these fruit flies allow us to have a very clear depiction of Parkinson's disease in a very quick way to test these Parkinson's symptoms. So in essence, what we do is we take a, park, a, uh, a fruit fly larva and we turn it on its back. And we time the amount of time that it takes that fruit fly larva to correct itself. That amount of time indicates the relative neuronal damage in that fruit fly nervous system. So a Parkinson's fruit fly will take significantly longer than an undiseased fruit fly to correct itself. And then we repeat this hundreds and hundreds of times to extract the data on the effectiveness of different treatments. If this sounds tedious, that's largely because it is. <laughs> but at the same time, it provides a very simple and valuable window into the effects of Parkinson's. There's no need for fancy equipment or expensive techniques and reagents. We can just simply look at a fruit fly larva under a microscope and have a stopwatch. So for the next several months, I dedicated myself to the science and the art of fly farming <laughs> to create several populations that we could test these Parkinson's compounds on, as well as a reliable model of Parkinson's disease. Now after all of this, all of this testing and all of this data collecting, all I could do was simply wait for the results to come in and simply take the amount of time that it takes for that larva to turn over and multiply that as, over as many cases I could to extract that valuable data on whether this disease treatment was effective or not. I still remember exactly where I was when I got the first results back from the tests. I could barely believe my eyes because the results were really nothing short of astonishing. What I had seen was a complete halting and possible reversal of Parkinson's symptoms in these fruit fly larvae. It's as if the Parkinson's disease was not even there. This graph right here on the screen, uh, on the right side, that's the fruit flies turning in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and then on the left side, that's a control. And the resulting data was nearly identical to that control group. So it was indistinguishable which flies didn't have Parkinson's and which flies were given the treatment for Parkinson's disease. What this project really showed me is that sometimes you need an outside perspective to tackle the biggest problems that we face in the world today. In this case, I looked at a biomedical problem from an engineering and mathematical perspective. What it also showed me is sometimes it's the humblest projects that have the biggest impact. In the world we live in today, we have climbed the highest mountains, plumbed the greatest depths of the ocean, and unlocked the secrets of the atom. Yet at the same time, it is those humble projects that often yield the greatest advancements. I hope that many projects like this, though humble, could be the small sparks that will light the fires of innovation and progress. What this has also shown me, and what I now firmly believe, is that it does not matter who you are or where you come from. If you see a problem in the world 
that needs to be solved, then by all means, go ahead and solve it. Thank you.